Now this is the account of the prior times and of the weapons of terror. Before the prior times was the beginning. After the prior times were the olden times. In the olden times, the gods came to earth and created the earthlings. In the prior times, none of the gods was on earth, nor were the earthlings yet fashioned. In the prior times, the abode of the gods was on their own planet. Nibiru is its name. A great planet, reddish in radiance, around the sun an elongated circuit Nibiru makes. For a time, in the cold, is Nibiru engulfed. For part of its circuit, by the sun, strongly is it heated. A thick atmosphere Nibiru envelops, by volcanic eruptions constantly fed. All manner of life this atmosphere sustains. Without it, there will be only perishing. In the cold period, the inner heat of Nibiru, it keeps about the planet, like a warm coat that is constantly renewed. In the hot period, it shields Nibiru from the sun's scorching rays. In its midst, rains it holds and releases, to lakes and streams giving rise. Lush vegetation our atmosphere feeds and protects. All manner of life in the waters and on the land to sprout it caused. After eons of time, our own species sprouted by our own essence and eternal seed to procreate. As our numbers grew, to many regions of Nibiru our ancestors spread some tilled the land, some four-legged creatures shepherded. Some lived on the mountains, some in the valleys their home made. Rivalries occurred, encroachments happened, clashes occurred, sticks became weapons. Clans gathered into tribes, then Two great nations each other faced. The nation of the north against the nation of the south took up arms. What was held by hand to thrusting missiles was turned. Weapons of thunder and brilliance increased the terror. A war long and fierce engulfed the planet. Brother amassed against brother. There was death and destruction both north and south. For many circuits desolation reigned the land. All life was diminished. Then a truce was declared. Then peacemaking was conducted. Let the nations be united, the emissaries said to one another. Let there be one throne on Nibiru, one king to reign over all. Let a leader from north or from south by lot be chosen, one king supreme to be. If he be from north, let south choose a female to be his spouse as equal queen to reign alongside. If by lot a south male be chosen, let the north's female be his spouse. Husband and wife let them be, as one flesh to become. Let their firstborn son be the successor. Let a unified dynasty thus be formed, unity on Nibiru forever to establish. In the midst of the ruins, peace was started. North and south, by marriage, were united. The royal throne into one flesh combined. An unbroken line of kingship established. The first king, after peace was made, a warrior of the north he was, 
a mighty commander. By lots, true and fair, was he chosen. His decrees in unity were accepted. For his abode, he built a splendid city, a gaudy, unity meaning was its name. For his reign, a royal title he was granted. Anne it was, the celestial one was its meaning. With strong arm, order in the lands he reestablished. Laws and regulations he decreed. Governors for each land he appointed. Restoration and reclamation was their foremost task. Of him in the royal annals, thus it was recorded, and the lands unified, peace on Nibiru he restored. He built a new city, the canals he repaired, food to the people he provided. There was abundance in the lands. For his spouse, the south, a maiden had chosen, for both love and warring, she was noted. Anne, too, was her royal title. The leader who is Anne's spouse, the given name cleverly did mean. She bore Anne three sons and no daughters. The firstborn son was by her named Anne Key. By Anne, a solid foundation was its meaning. Alone on the throne he was seated. A spouse to choose was twice postponed. In his reign, concubines were brought into the palace. A son to him was not born. The dynasty thus begun was by the death of Anki disrupted. On the foundation, no offspring followed. The middle son Though not the firstborn, the legal heir was pronounced. From his youth, one of three brothers, Ib, by his mother was lovingly called. The one in the middle, his name did mean. By the royal annals, An Ib, he is named, in kingship celestial. By generations, the one who is Anne's son, the name signified. He followed his father Anne on Nibiru's throne. By count, he was the third to reign. The daughter of his younger brother, he chose to be his spouse. Nin-Ib, she was called. The Lady of Ib. A son to Anib by Ninib was born. The successor on the throne he was, the fourth by the Count of Kings. By the royal name Anshar Gaul, he wished himself to be known. Anne's prince, who is greatest of princes, was the meaning. His spouse, a half-sister, Kishar Gaul, was equally named. Knowledge and understanding were his chief ambition. The ways of the heavens he assiduously studied. The great circuit of Nibiru he studied. Its length a shar to be he fixed. As one year of Nibiru was the measure, by it the royal reigns to be numbered and recorded the shar to ten portions he divided. Two festivals thereby he pronounced. When nearest to the sun's quarters, a festival of the warmth was celebrated. When to its far abode Nibiru was distanced, the festival of coolness was decreed. Replacing all olden festivals of tribes and nations, to unify the people, the two were established. Laws of husband and wife, of sons and daughters, by decree he established. 
customs from the first tribes he proclaimed for the whole land. From the wars, females greatly outnumbered males. Decrees he made, one male to have more than one female for knowing. By law, one wife as official spouse to be chosen, first wife to be called. By law, the firstborn son was his father's successor. By these laws, confusion soon came about. If the firstborn son, not by the first wife, was born, and thereafter, by the first wife, a son was born, by law the legal heir becoming, who shall be the successor? The one by the count of Shars firstborn? The one by the first wife born? The firstborn son? The legal heir? Who shall inherit? Who shall succeed? In the reign of Anshargal, Kishargal as first wife was pronounced. A half-sister of the king she was. In Anshargal's reign, concubines were again brought into the palace. By the concubines, sons and daughters to the king were born. A son by one was the first to be born. The son of a concubine was the firstborn. Thereafter, Kishargal bore a son. The legal heir by law he was. The firstborn he was not. In the palace, Kishargal raised her voice in anger, shouting, If by rules my son, by a first wife born, from succession shall be barred, let the double seed not be neglected. Though of different mothers, of one father, the king and I are offspring. I am the king's half-sister. To me the king is half-brother. By that my son, the double seed of our father, Anib, possesses. Let henceforth the law of the seed, the law of espousal, overpower. Let henceforth a son by a half-sister, whenever born, above all other sons, rise to succession. Anshargal, contemplating the law of the seed, embraced with favor. Confusion of spouse and concubines, of marriage and divorce, it would be avoided. In their council, the royal counselors, the law of the seed for succession adopted. By the king's order, the scribes the decree recorded. Thus, the next king, by the law of the seed for succession, was proclaimed. To him, the royal name, Anne Shar, was granted. Fifth on the throne he was. Now this is the account of the reign of Anshar and the kings who followed. When the law was changed, the other princes were contending. Words there were. Rebellion there was not. As his spouse, Anshar, a half-sister, chose, he made her first wife. By the name Kishar, she was called. Thus was by this law the dynasty continued. In the reign of Anshar, the fields diminished their yields. Fruits and grains lost abundance. From circuit to circuit, nearing the sun, heat grew stronger. In the faraway abode, Coolness was more biting. In Agade, the throne city, 
the king, those of great understanding, assembled. Learned savants, those of great knowledge, to inquire were commanded. The land and the soil they examined, the lakes and streams they put to the test. It has happened before, some gave an answer. Nibiru in the past, colder or warmer has grown. A destiny it is, in the circuit of Nibiru embedded. Others of knowledge, the circuit observing, Nibiru's destiny to blame did not consider. In the atmosphere, a breaching had occurred. That was their finding. Volcanoes, the atmosphere, four bearers, less belching were spitting up. Nibiru's air has thinner been made. The protective shield has been diminished. In the reign of Anshar and Kishar, pestilences of the field made appearance. Toil could them not overcome. Their son, Enshar, then the throne ascended. Of the dynasty, the sixth he was. Lordly master of the Shar, the name did signify. With great understanding he was born. With much learning he mastered much knowledge. To remedy the afflictions, ways he sought. Of Nibiru's heavenly circuit he made much study. In its loop, of the sun's family, five members it embraced, planets of dazzling beauty. For cures to the afflictions, their atmospheres he caused to be examined. To each he gave a name, ancestral forefathers he honored, as heavenly couples he them considered. An and Antu, the twin-like planets, he called the first two to be encountered. Beyond, in Nibiru's circuit, were Anshar and Kishar, in their size the largest. As a messenger, Gaga among the others coursed, sometimes first Nibiru to meet. Five in all were Nibiru's heavenly greeters as the sun it circled. Beyond, like a boundary, the hammered bracelet the sun encircled. As a guardian of the heaven's forbidden region, with havoc it protected. Other children of the sun, four in number, from intrusion the bracelet shielded. The atmospheres of the five greeters, Enshar set out to study. In its repeating circuit, the five in Nibiru's loop carefully were examined. What atmospheres they possessed by observation and with celestial chariots intensely were examined. The findings were astounding, the discoveries confusing. From circuit to circuit, Nibiru's atmosphere more breaching suffered. In the councils of the learned, cures were avidly debated. Ways to bandage the wound were urgently considered. A new shield to embrace the planet was attempted. All that was thrust up, back to the ground came down. In the councils of the learned, the belching volcanoes were studied. The atmosphere, by belching volcanoes, having been created, its wound, by their diminished belching, had come to be. Let, with invention, new belching be encouraged. Let volcanoes spew again, one savant group was saying. How the feat to achieve? With what tools more belching to attain? None the king could inform. In the reign of Enshar, the breach in the skies grew bigger. Rains were withheld. Winds blew harder. Springs from the depths did not arise. 
in the land there was an accusation. The breasts of mothers were dry. In the palace there was distress. An accusation therein took hold. As his first wife, Enshar, a half-sister did espouse, by the law of the seed abiding. Ninshar she was called, of the Shars, the lady. A son she did not bear. By a concubine, to Enshar, a son was born. The first-born son he was. By Ninshar, first wife and half-sister, a son was not brought forth. By the law of succession, the concubine's son, the throne ascended. The seventh to reign he was. Du Uru was his royal name. In the dwelling place fashion was its meaning. In the house of concubines, not in the palace, was he indeed conceived. As his spouse, a maiden from his youth, beloved, to Uru chose, by love, not by seed, a first wife he selected. Da Uru was her royal name. She who is by my side was the meaning. In the royal court, confusion was rampant. Sons were not heirs, wives were not half-sisters. In the land, suffering was increasing. The fields forgot their abundance. Among the people, fertility was diminished. In the palace, fertility was absent. Neither son nor daughter was brought forth. Of Anne's seed, seven were the rulers. Then, of his seed, the throne was dry. Da'uru, a child at the palace gateway found. As a son, she embraced him. Du'uru, in the end, as a son, him adopted. Legal heir, him decreed. Lama meaning dryness, was his given name. In the palace, the princes were grumbling. In the council of counselors, there were complaints. In the end, Lama, the throne ascended. Though not of Anne's seed, he was the eighth to reign. In the councils of the learned, to heal the breach, there were two suggestions. One was to use a metal. Gold was its name. On Nibiru it was greatly rare. Within the hammered bracelet it was abundant. It was the only substance that to the finest powder could be ground. Lofted high to heaven, suspended it could remain. Thus, with replenishments, the breach it would heal, protection make better. Let celestial boats be built. Let a celestial fleet the gold to Nibiru bring over. Let weapons of terror be created, was the other suggestion. Weapons that the ground shake loose, the mountains split asunder. With missiles, the volcanoes to attack, their dormancy to bestir, their belching to increase, the atmosphere to replenish, the breach to make disappear. For a decision, Lama was too feeble. What choice to make, he knew not. One circuit Nibiru completed. Two shars Nibiru to count continued. In the fields, affliction was not diminished. By volcanic belching, the atmosphere was not repaired. A third shar passed. A fourth was counted. Gold was not obtained. In the land, strife was abundant. 
food and water were not abundant. In the land, unity was gone. Accusations were abundant. In the royal court, savants were coming and going. Counselors were rushing in and rushing out. The king, to their words, paid no attention. Counsel from his spouse he only sought. Lahama was her name. If destiny it be, let us beseech the great creator of all, to the king, she said. Beseeching, not actings, provide the only hope. In the royal court, the princes were astir. At the king, accusations were directed. Foolishly, unreasoning, greater calamities instead of cure he brought forth. From the olden storehouses, weapons were retrieved. Of rebellion, there was much speaking. A prince in the royal palace was the first to take up arms. By words of promise, the other princes he agitated. Alalu was his name. Let Lama be the king no more, he shouted. Let decision supplant hesitation. Come, let us unnerve the king in his dwelling. Let him the throne abandon. The princes to his words gave heed. The gate of the palace they rushed. To the throne room, its entrance restricted. Like on-rushing waters they went. To the tower of the palace, the king escaped. Alalu was him pursuing. In the tower, there was a struggle. Lama fell down to his death. Lama is no more, Alalu shouted. The king is no more. With glee, he announced. To the throne room, Alalu rushed. On the throne, he himself seated. Without right or counsel, a king he himself pronounced. In the land, unity was lost. Some by the death of Lama rejoiced. Others by Alalu's deed were saddened. Now this is the account of the kingship of Alalu and of the going to earth. In the land, unity was lost. About the kingship, many were aggrieved. In the palace, princes were agitated. In the council, counselors were distraught. From father to son, succession from Anne on the throne continued. Even Lama, the eighth, by adoption, a son was proclaimed. Who was Alalu? Was he a legal heir? Was he firstborn? By what right did he usurp? Was he not a king's slayer? Before the seven who judge, Alalu was summoned, his fate to consider. Before the seven who judge, Alalu spread his pleas. Though neither legal heir nor a son firstborn, of royal seed indeed he was. Of Anshargal am I descended, before the judges he claimed. By a concubine my ancestor was to him born. Alam was his name. By the Count of Shars, Alam was the firstborn. The throne to him belonged. By conniving, the queen his rights put aside. A law of the seed, from naught she created. For her son, the kingship obtained. Alam, of kingship, she deprived. To her son, instead, it was granted. By descent, 
of Alam's generations, am I continued. The seed of Anshar Gaul is within me. The seven who judged to Alalu's words gave heed. To the council of counselors they passed the matter, truth or falsehood to ascertain. The royal annals from the house of records were brought forth. With much care they were read. Anne and Antu, the first royal couple, were. Three sons and no daughters to them were born. The firstborn was Anki. He died on the throne. He had no offspring. The middle son, in his stead, the throne ascended. Anib was his name. Anshargal was his firstborn. The throne he ascended. After him, on the throne, kingship by the firstborn did not continue. The law of succession by the law of the seed, was supplanted. A concubine's son was the firstborn. By the law of the seed, of kingship, he was deprived. The kingship, instead, to Kishargal's son was granted. Her being a half-sister of the king was the reason. Of the concubine's son, the firstborn, the annals made no record. Of him I am descended, Alalu to the counselors cried out. By the law of succession, to him kingship belonged. By the law of succession, to kingship am I now entitled. With hesitation, the counselors of Alalu an oath of truth demanded. Alalu swore the oath of life or death. As king, the council him considered. They summoned the elders. They summoned the princes. Before them, the decision was pronounced. From among the princes, a young prince stepped forward about the kingship, words he wished to say. Succession must be reconsidered, to the assembly, he said though neither firstborn, nor by the queen a son, of pure seed am I descended. The essence of Anne in me is preserved, by no concubine deluded. The counselors heard the words with amazement. The young prince to step closer they summoned. They asked for his name. It is Anu. After my forefather Anne am I named. They inquired about his generations. Of Anne's three sons he them reminded. Anki was the firstborn. Without son or daughter he died. Anib was the middle son. Instead of Anki the throne he ascended. Anib, the daughter of his younger brother, took to be wife. From them onward, the succession is in the annals recorded. Who was that younger brother, a son of Anne and Antu, one of purest seed? The counselors with wonderment looked at each other. Iniru was his name, Anu to them announced. He was my great ancestor. His spouse, Ninuru, was a half-sister. Her son was first born. Inama was his name. His wife was a half-sister by laws of seed and succession, a son she bore him. Of pure descent, the generations continued by law and by seed perfect. Anu, after our forefather Anne, did my parents name me. From the throne ship we were removed, from Anne's pure seed we were not removed. Let Anu be king, many counselors shouted. Let Alalu be removed. Others cautioned did counsel. Let strife be prevented. Let unity prevail. They called in Alalu, 
the discovered findings to be told. To the prince Anu, Alalu, his arm in an embrace offered. To Anu, he thus said, Though by different offsprings, of one ancestor we are both descended. Let us live in peace. Together, Nibiru, to abundance, return. Let me keep the throne. Let you keep the succession. To the council, words he directed. Let Anu, crown prince, be. Let him be my successor. Let his son, my daughter, espouse. Let succession be united. And who bowed before the council, to the assembly he thus declared, Alalu's cupbearer I shall be, his successor in waiting, a son of mine, a daughter of his, as bride shall choose. That was the council's decision. In the royal annals it was inscribed. In this manner, Alalu, on the throne remained seated. He summoned the sages, savants, and commanders he consulted. For deciding, he gained much knowledge. Let celestial boats be constructed, he decided. To seek the gold in the hammered bracelet, he decided. By the hammered bracelet, the boats were crushed. None of them returned. Let with weapons of terror the bowels of Nibiru be cut open. Let volcanoes again erupt, he then commanded. With weapons of terror, sky-borne chariots were armed. With terror missiles from the skies were volcanoes struck. The mountains swayed, the valleys shuddered, as great brilliances with thunder exploded. In the land there was much rejoicing. Of abundance there were expectations. In the palace, Anu was for Alalu the cupbearer. He would bow at Alalu's feet, set the drinking cup in Alalu's hand. Alalu was the king. Anu, as a servant by him, was treated. In the land, rejoicing receded. Rains were withheld. Winds blew harder. The belching by volcanoes did not increase. The breach in the atmosphere did not heal. In the heavens, Nibiru its circuits kept coursing. From circuit to circuit, heat and cold grew harder to suffer. The people of Nibiru ceased to revere their king. Instead of relief, misery he caused. Alalu on the throne remained seated. The strong and wise Anu, foremost among the princes, was standing before him. He would bow to Alalu's feet, set the drinking cup in Alalu's hand. For nine counted periods, Alalu was king on Nibiru. In the ninth shar, Anu gave battle to Alalu. To hand-to-hand -hand combat, with bodies naked, Alalu he challenged. Let the winner be king, Anu said. They grappled with each other in the public square. Doorposts trembled and walls shook. Alalu bent his knee. To the ground he fell on his chest. Alalu in combat was defeated. By acclaim, Anu was hailed as king. Anu to the palace was escorted. Alalu to the palace did not return. From the crowds he stealthily escaped. Of doing like Lama, he was fearful. Unbeknownst to others, to the palace of the celestial chariots he hurriedly went. Into a missile-throwing chariot Alalu climbed. 
Its hatch behind him he closed. The four-part chamber he entered. The commander's seat he occupied. That which shows the way he lit up, with bluish aura the chamber filling. The fire stones he stirred up. Their hum like music was enthralling. The chariot's great cracker he enlivened. A reddish brilliance it was casting. Unbeknownst to others, in the celestial boat, Alalu, from Nibiru, escaped. To snow-hued earth, Alalu set his course. By a secret, from the beginning, he chose his destination. To regions forbidden, Alalu made his way. No one has gone there before. No one at the hammered bracelet a crossing had attempted. A secret from the beginning Alalu's course had determined. The fate of Nibiru in his hands it placed. By a scheme, his kingship to make universal. On Nibiru, exile was certain. There, death itself he was chancing. In his scheme, risk was in the journey... Eternal glory if success was the reward. Riding like an eagle, Alalu the heavens scanned. Below, Nibiru was a ball in a voidness hanging. Alluring was its figure. Its radiance emblazoned the surrounding heavens. Its measure was enormous. Its belchings fire blazed forth. Its life-sustaining envelope... Its hue, a redness, was like a sea churning. In its midst, the breach was distinct, like a darkened wound. He looked down again. The wide breach turned into a small tub. He looked again. Nibiru's great ball turned into a small fruit. The next time he looked, in the wide dark sea, Nibiru disappeared. Remorse, the heart of Alalu grasped. Fear held him in its hands. Decision to hesitation turned. To halt in his tracks, Alalu considered. Then, from audacity to decision, he returned. A hundred leagues, a thousand leagues, the chariot was coursing. Ten thousand leagues the chariot was journeying. In the wide heavens, darkness was the darkest. In the far away, distant stars, their eyes were blinking. More leagues Alalu traveled. Then a sight of great joy met his gaze. In the expanse of the heavens, the celestial's emissary was him greeting. Little Gaga, the one who shows the way. By its circuit, Alalu was greeting, to him a welcome extending. With a leaning gait, before and after, the celestial and too it was destined to travel. To face forward, to face backward, with two facings was it endowed. Its appearance as first to greet Alalu as a good omen he at once considered. By the celestial gods he is welcomed. So was his understanding. In his chariot, Alalu followed Gaga's path. To the second god of the heavens it was directing. Soon, celestial and too, its name by Enshar was given. In the deeps, darkness was looming. Blue as pure waters was her hue. Of the upper waters, she was the commencement. Alalu, by the sight's beauty, was enchanted. To course at a distance, he continued. In the far beyond, Antu's spouse began to shimmer. By size, Antu's the equal as his spouse's double, by a greenish blueness, was and distinguished. A dazzling host encircled it on its side. 
with firm grounds they were provided. To the two celestials, Alalu bade a fond farewell, the path of Gaga still discerning. The way it was showing to its olden master, of whom it was once the counselor, to Anshar, the foremost prince of the heavens, the course was a turning. By the speeding chariot, Alalu the ensnaring pull of Anshar could tell. With bright rings of dazzling colors, the chariot it was enchanting. His gaze, Alalu to one side quickly turned. That which shows the way, with might he diverted. A sight most awesome then to him appeared. In the faraway heavens, the family's bright star he discerned. A sight most frightening the revelation followed. A giant monster in its destiny moving, upon the sun a darkening cast. Kishar, its creator swallowed. Frightening was the occurrence. An evil omen, Alalu indeed thought. The giant Kishar, foremost of the firm planets, its size was overwhelming. Swirling storms obscured its face, colored spots they moved about. A host beyond counting, some quickly, some slowly, the celestial god encircled. Troublesome were their ways, back and forth they were surging. Kishar itself a spell was casting, divine lightnings it was thrusting. As Alalu looked on, his course became upset. His direction was distracted. His doings became confused. Then the deepness darkening began to depart. Kishar, on his destiny, continued to circuit. Slowly moving, its veil from the shining sun it lifted. The one from the beginning came fully into view. Joy in Alalu's heart was not long-lasting. Beyond the fifth planet, the utmost danger was lurking. So indeed he knew. The hammered bracelet ahead was reigning. To demolish it was awaiting. Of rocks and boulders was it together hammered. Like orphans with no mother, they banded together. Surging back and forth, a bygone destiny they followed. Their doings were loathsome. Troubling were their ways. Nibiru's probing chariots, like praying lions they devoured. The precious gold, needed for surviving, they refused to dislodge. The chariot of Alalu toward the hammered bracelet was headlong moving. The ferocious boulders in close combat to boldly face. Alalu, the firestones in his chariot more strongly stirred up. That which shows the way with steady hands he directed. The ominous boulders against the chariot charged forward like an enemy in battle attacking. Toward them, Alalu, a death-dealing missile from the chariot let loose. Then another, and another, against the enemy the terror weapons he thrust. As frightened warriors, the boulders turned back, a path for Alalu granting. Like by a spell, the hammered bracelet, a doorway to the king it opened. In the dark deepness, Alalu, the heavens could clearly see. By the bracelet's ferocity he was not defeated, his mission was not ended. In the distance the sun's fiery ball its brilliance was sending forth, welcoming rays toward Alalu it was emitting. Before it a red-brown planet on its circuit was coursing, the sixth in the count of celestial gods it was. Alalu could but glimpse it, on its destined course from Alalu's path it was quickly moving. 
Then snow-hued earth appeared, the seventh in the celestial count. Toward the planet, Alalu set his course to a destination most inviting. Smaller than Nibiru was its alluring ball. Weaker than Nibiru's was its attracting net. Its atmosphere, thinner than Nibiru's was, clouds were within it swirling. Below, the earth to three regions was divided, snow white at the top and on the bottom, blue and brown in between. Deftly, Alalu spread the chariot's arresting wings around the earth's ball to encircle. In the middle region, dry lands and watery oceans he could discern. The beam that penetrates downward he directed, earth's innards to detect. I have attained it, ecstatically he shouted. Gold, much gold, the beam has indicated. It was beneath the dark-hued region. In the waters it was, too. With pounding heart, Alalu, a decision was contemplating. Shall he on the dry land his chariot bring down, perchance to crash and die? Shall he to the waters his course direct, to perchance into oblivion sink? Which way shall he survive? Will he the treasured gold discover? In the eagle's seat, Alalu was not stirring. To fate's hands, the chariot he entrusted. Fully caught in earth's attracting net, the chariot was moving faster. Its spread wings became a glow. Earth's atmosphere like an oven was. Then the chariot shook, emitting a mortifying thunder. With abruptness, the chariot crashed, with a suddenness altogether stopping. Senseless from the shaking, stunned by the crash, Alalu was without moving. Then he opened his eyes and knew he was among the living. At the planet of gold, he victoriously arrived.